Lots to get to, but we're going to start with a few words from Jace Medical. Uh, just like it was back in the pandemic, we are facing actual drug and medical supply shortages in the United States. I had a friend who had to drive 45 minutes just to pick up one prescription. 45 minutes for one prescription. That's not supposed to happen. You should be searching for stuff like you're, you know, Indiana Jones. You should be able to just go to your local pharmacy and get the stuff you need. Well, that's not always the case anymore. There's 200 drug shortages here in America going on right now. And healthcare experts have all sorts of warnings about what could be right around the corner. This is America. We're not supposed to be seeing that stuff. And that's why you need the Jace case from Jace Medical. It provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use. All you got to do is fill out the form online and you'll have it there ready in case you need it. Dozens of add-on options as well. They really can customize this thing for you. And Jace Medical has been empowering people just like you to be able to take your family's health into your own hands for a long time now. Check them out today, jacemedical.com. Jacemedical.com, use the code STU at checkout, get a discount on your order. The promo code is STU at jacemedical.com, J-A-S-E medical.com. Get all the 2024 election info you need on the State of the Race podcast. It's a Stu Does America podcast sub-series. Makes it sound official, doesn't it? Uh, if we have a, uh, a new episode actually coming up tomorrow. Uh, so don't miss it. Stu Does America stream wherever you get your podcast. You'll just get State of the Race popping up in your feed tomorrow. A little bonus pod for you looking at uh, the 2024 election and everything surrounding it. Be sure to check out the show on YouTube as well, youtube.com slash America. Be sure to like and comment on the videos. Hit the bell for notifications. I say that all the time. Do, do you guys do it? I mean, I just please, I don't know. I say it every day, and I don't know that you do it. I mean, it seems like the numbers go up. But, like, if you're sitting here and you're like, oh, I listen to the show all the time or watch the show all the time, I don't click like, I don't follow the channel. I mean, I, please, I, I don't know how else to ask. Justin Haskins is going to be here to terrify us on the state of U.S. election security. Donald Trump faces more fines in his hush money trial in New York. But we're going to start by doing the UCLA escalation. And, and, and normally, like, I like to tell you about what's going on and then kind of focus on the politics of it all. But let me reverse that today and just talk about the politics right off the top. This is an extremely difficult situation for Joe Biden. He is, he is in a, a, the midst of a conundrum, if you will. Now, you might say to yourself, good, which is a big thing that I say when I think about this. If I take everything else, like I take all the virulent anti-Semitism and the, whatever the, this means for the future of our country and all the scary crap that surrounds it and just particularly look at the politics of this moment, I think um, good because Joe Biden is not good at this job. And even if he was good at this job, it would be very difficult to navigate those waters. Well, why? He's losing youth support in all the polls right now. Uh, one of the reasons why he is behind in almost all these swing states and behind in this election. And if this is a spoiler alert uh, for tomorrow's state of the race, but like if the election were held today, Donald Trump would likely win it and maybe handily. And so the question is, well, why? Why is that happening to Joe Biden? Who has he lost? Well, he's lost some people across the board, but the biggest chunk of people outside of certain minority groups that he has to worry about are younger voters. Younger voters are not enthusiastic at all with Joe Biden. Now, that doesn't mean they love Trump. In fact, one of the main reasons why they don't seem to be so enthralled with Joe Biden is his supposed support for Israel. And again, I don't really see it. You know, sure, he hasn't advocated for the nuclear annihilation of Israel. So I guess that in, in their eyes makes him pro-Israel. But I mean, he's been undercutting them every single step of the way on this war. And yes, he's allowed some weapon sales. And yes, he's had some supportive comments. He hasn't been, this has certainly not been his worst issue, for my opinion. He, you know, he's, from my perspective, he's certainly done other things that have been worse than his Israel support. But I don't think he gets the credit with the hardcore Israel haters and Hamas lovers that he deserves for the way he's undercut Israel and their efforts here. Um, but he's losing support among young voters. So 
He really has to kind of appease them. At least this is what's in his head. He has to be nice to the protesters. He has to show that he cares about their stupid uh, anti-Semitic complaints. He has to do that at some level. He doesn't want to signal hardcore opposition to it because then he could lose even more of these people. Now, Biden could see this as an opportunity. And this is something we talked about the other day. If he saw this as an opportunity and said, hey, you know what? This could be my sister soldier moment. Everyone hates these protesters. Nobody likes the fact that people are out in the streets doing this. It's an 80-20 issue in polls. Americans don't want chaos. They generally support Israel uh, in this uh, in this debate. And so why not take this moment and go after the worst of the worst and really lay into the anti-Semites on these campuses, focus on particular individuals who are leading this, show that you actually give a crap about this issue. Well, instead, he decided to just basically say nothing. He released a, a, a statement, a paper statement uh, a few days ago. His, his, his uh, you know, nonsensical automatron spokespeople have come out and blabbed a little bit about it, but it's been really underwhelming. Um, now, he has spent his entire presidency kissing the ass of people like AOC. That's been his approach to this presidency. He has not tried to go to the middle. He's not tried to do anything like Bill Clinton did. In fact, he hasn't even tried to do it as much as Barack Obama has done. He has run as probably the most progressive president we've seen maybe since LBJ, uh, you know, and LBJ had his own set of issues. But from an opportunity standpoint, this could be a way to really knock down some of the concerns of Middle of the road voters. You think about the you know, person who might be slightly liberal, thinking about voting for Biden, but really upset at the way he's handled this Israel situation, meaning that he's not uh, supporting Israel enough. You know, obviously, Jewish voters in the, in the United States tend to vote Democrat. Some of them are getting skeptical of that and looking at Donald Trump and saying, I don't know, maybe we should go over there. You're not going to lose these hardcore left lunatics like they're. Yeah, a few of them might vote for Jill Stein or Cornell West, but generally speaking, you're probably okay there. You need to get the people in the middle. Instead of doing that, he's just been like, you know, just doing absolutely nothing. Um, and he attempted, I guess, to address this today. Finally, after all this time, Biden says he supports the right to protest, but denounces chaos and hate speech. Let me give you a taste of this completely underwhelming blathering that he proposed uh, a little bit earlier today. We've all seen the images, and they put to the test two fundamental American principles. Excuse me. Cough. <clears throat> get to one, the two first sentences. Is the right to free speech? Yeah, sure. And for people to peacefully assemble and make their voices heard. Yeah, but that's the not what they're doing. Is the rule of law. Mm, you care about Both that? Both must be upheld. Mm. We are not an authoritarian nation where we silence people or squash dissent. Mm. The American people are heard. In fact, peaceful protest is in the best tradition of how Americans respond to consequential issues. Unless you do it on Facebook, but, then we'll probably censor but you. But neither are we a lawless country. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're a civil Another society. Another cough, by the way. And order must prevail. Throughout our history, we've often faced <laughs> Real moments passion like this behind because that. we are a big, diverse, free-thinking, and freedom-loving nation. In moments like this, there are always those who rush in to score political points. But this isn't a moment for politics. Right. It's a moment for clarity. That's all he's doing is so politics. let me be clear. Peaceful protest in America. Violent protest is not protected. Peaceful protest is. It's against the law when violence occurs. Destroying property is not a peaceful protest. Where was this in 2020? It's against the law. Vandalism, trespassing, breaking windows, shutting down campuses, forcing the cancellation of classes and graduations. None of this is a peaceful protest. Threatening people intimidating people, instilling fear in people is not peaceful protest. It's against the law. Dissent is essential to democracy, but dissent must never lead to disorder or to denying the rights of others so students can finish the semester and their college education. So you get the point there, basically like, oh yeah, free speech, we all care about free speech, but you know, we uh, when you're breaking windows and lighting things on fire, that's not free speech. Look, this is of course the approach that we were begging for in 2020. Um, now, there's not any passion behind it. Uh, you can tell it's a boilerplate sort of comment. Uh, he throws it out there to check a couple of boxes and say, hey, I swear I said something. Look at the speech I made, it, which is the reason he released a paper statement initially. It was just to check a box that he could refer to when some of his uh, voters are upset that he's not doing anything about this. Uh, but he did continue to blather on about the topic and broaden it just a bit. Look. Look. It's basically a matter of fairness. Really? It's a matter of what's right. 
There's the right to protest, but not the right to cause chaos. Mm, wow. People have the right to get an education, the right to get a degree. It's not really a right to a degree. The right in the to country, walk across the campus safely without fear of being attacked. That would be nice. But let's be clear about this as well. There should be no place on any campus, no place in America for anti-Semitism or threats of violence against Jewish students. Mm, thank you. There is no place for hate speech or violence of any kind, whether it's anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, no, got or discrimination it. against Arab Americans or Palestinian Americans. It's simply wrong. There's no place for racism in America. It's all wrong. It's un-American. I understand people have strong feelings and deep convictions. In America, we respect the right and protect the right for them to express that. But it doesn't mean anything goes. It needs to be done without violence, without destruction, without hate, and within the law. You know, make no mistake, as president, I will always defend free speech. <laughs> yeah. I will always be just as strong as standing up for the rule of law. Will you? That's my responsibility to you, the American people, and my obligation to the Constitution. Thank you very much. It's as if he doesn't know he, we know that he's been president. Like, it's as if we haven't seen him do anything. He's been ignoring laws like crazy the entire time he's been president. By the way, he was trying to get some, there were some questions being asked by the press as he walked out. Here's how he handled those. Mr. President, have the protests forced you to reconsider any of the policies with regard to the region? No. Thank Mr. You. President, do you think the National Guard should intervene? No. Mr. President, do you agree to <laughs> no, no. Okay, well, good. Um, I, you know, look, it, it is a. It was an uninspiring speech. I, I think he did check some of the boxes. It wasn't his worst moment. How about that? At least he didn't have like a blood red dripping down the walls behind him and lighting uh, like some of the speeches he's done. Uh, it was, you know, not good. But uh, I think it's more of a of a limitation of Biden than even the content of what he said. He's just not good at this. He has no passion. He looks like he's about to collapse in the middle of all these speeches. And I don't know that he's ever going to be able to correct that. If you happen to be someone who wants him to win, I don't know what to tell you. He, he just does not have the capability, even in these moments. Now, I don't think he actually cares about this. And so there's no real passion there, but we will see. Um, now, of course, the kid gloves that have been used by the left to try to deal with these protests have been laughable from the start. This is a real article, by the way, in The New York Times. Before the violence, UCLA thought a tolerant approach would work. Why? What evidence do you have that crazy leftist protesters are going to leave when you tolerate them? Does anyone remember Chaz or, or yeah, what was it? Yeah, Chaz in uh, Portland, where they just created their own, it was it Seattle, I can't remember. There's a couple of them that popped up around that time. But like, they just created their own freaking society in the middle of the city. The way that ends is you taking down the tents and getting everybody the hell out of there. Being tolerant of it means it goes on forever. Because these people, largely, wind up being professional protesters that just show up out of nowhere. Look, free speech is free speech. I agree with anyone who, who says that. I, I'm, I'm much more lenient on free speech than, uh, you know, many, many on the left and even some on the right. Um, but at the end of the day, like, when you break the law, you break the law. You don't break the law by saying you don't like Israel's policies. You break the law by putting up tents where they're not supposed to be, damaging property, assaulting police officers, raping your fellow protesters. All these things that tend to go on at these particular events are an issue. Um, the way to handle this is uh, the way to handle an encampment is to show that there is no encampment. The first tent that goes up gets taken down. You don't let the encampment begin. There's no encampment to go against because you've removed the tents and thrown the people off of campus as soon as they start trying this crap. How is this hard? It's not. But they don't want to do anything to stop this stuff because they generally favor it. The only reason they don't favor it is when it starts hurting them politically, which is where we are now. Now, of course, as I mentioned, it's not all students. Uh, how about the 63-year-old career activist who is among the protesters at Columbia? Um, this is someone who has been called a, prof a professional agitator. And they, of course, were some of the people who took over uh, the hall at Columbia. And that's what you should expect. This is what happens when you let this stuff fester, when you deal with it with tolerance. Look, run your mouth, say all the dumb crap that you're wrong about, about Israel. That's fine. Do it as much as you want. But when it comes to the point where you are breaking the law, 
that has to be dealt with. And these these people are so feeble minded that they think uh, at the end of the day, these people, ah, they're fine. They're just protesting. What's wrong with a few tents? I mean, take out the fact that they're breaking the law and that violence always ensues from these uh, encampments. They also just ruin the entire area wherever they are. They load it with garbage. They they pee and poop right in the middle of the freaking uh, square. Uh, they uh, assault people that are passing by. They, I mean, there was one case we talked about it the other day where a Jewish student was basically taken hostage for a half an hour. Couldn't, they wouldn't let him leave. That's not okay in this country. Uh, police and pro-Palestinian demonstrators clash in a tense scene at UCLA encampment, and this is what happens when you don't deal with these things more harshly. Um, if you don't shut it down immediately, eventually, people from the other side say, what the hell is going on on my campus? I'm going to go down there and shut it down myself. So that happened. A bunch of anti-encampment protesters came down, and of course a battle ensued. This is from Julio, Julio Rosas, which uh, welcomed Julio to uh, The Blaze. He's a new uh, reporter for The Blaze. He's got a bunch of footage of what went on. Watch. <laughs> Amazing. This is America. Look at this. I mean, this is this is repulsive. And you know who knows it is Joe Biden. Uh, he knows this is not a good look for for uh, for his campaign. His his whole society uh, that he's supposedly managing so so capably is falling apart. Look at this. And this is disgraceful. This is your country. Absolutely incredible. Uh, by the way, the protesters do have requests, and I'm sure they'd be completely fine if they just got this stuff. They would go away immediately. Let me give you the list. Um, well, headlamps they need, uh, airsoft goggles, gas masks and respirators, especially for our medics. Why do they need medics, by the way? I don't even understand that. Uh, probably because after they rape each other, they need some place to go. Um, skater helmets, shields, wood for barrier, knee and elbow pads, rain ponchos, uh, canopies, utility gloves, without reinforced knuckles of various sizes, especially for small hands. <laughs> uh, super bright flashlights with strobe, charged umbrellas, EpiPens, non-steroid inhalers, headlamps, organ organizational bins, uh, and for food, they need hot food for lunch, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, parentheses, important in all caps, exclamation point, exclamation point, and parentheses. They don't want no cold lunch, okay? I think that was very, very clear. Do not bring them a room temperature sandwich. Vegan food, got to have that. Gluten-free food, you cannot have a revolution built on gluten. That does not exist. Uh, ice, no packaged food. They don't want your Lunchables. Don't bring those. No coffee, no bagels. Well, bagels, I mean, they do not seem to like Jewish delicatessens all that much, so don't bring any bagels. No bananas. Why? Bananas are awesome. No nuts. Uh, the entire encampment's filled with nuts. Okay? It's already there. Uh, and if you fill out the form, if you're coordinating a meal, good, good luck with that. Put your name on a form with this group. That's going to really work out well. A uh, Columbia student has been mocked for viral video telling reporters that occupiers might die without food delivery. I just can't love this video enough. This is a student protester just getting schooled by actually media members asking questions. Why what should the university be steps? obligated to provide food to people who have taken over a building? Hmm. Uh, well, for, first of all, we're saying that they're obligated to provide food to students who pay for a meal plan here. But you mentioned that there was a request to, that food and water be brought in, unless I misunderstood. To allow it to be brought in. I mean, well, I guess it's ultimately a question of what kind of community and obligation Columbia feels it has to its students. Um, do you want students to die of dehydration and starvation <laughs> oh, or get happen. severely ill, even mm -hmm. if they disagree with you? If the answer is no, then you should allow basic, I mean, it's crazy to say because we're on an Ivy League campus, but this is like basic humanitarian aid we're asking for. Like, could people please have a glass of water? But they, they, they did put themselves in that, very deliberately, in that situation and in that position. So it, it seems like you're sort of saying, we want to be revolutionaries, we want to take up this building, now would you please bring us food and water? Nobody's asking them to bring anything. Every, we're, we're asking them to not violently stop us from bringing they, in basic humanitarian doing. aid. They're stopping the delivery of food? I, we are looking for a commitment from them that they will not God, stop it. Clip. They haven't stopped it yet. 
We, well, I don't, I'm not, I don't know to what extent it has been attempted, but we're looking for a commitment. I mean, so, hey, you want to be revolutionaries and also you want them to bring you food after you've taken over their building? Uh, and she said, oh, no, we don't need to bring them food. Uh, we just don't want them to violently stop us. And then someone follows up. Uh, have they violently stopped us? Well, of course, the answer to that is no. They haven't violently stopped us. They're looking for a commitment that in theory they won't do that in the future. And by the way, no one's going to die from dehydration inside of a Columbia room unless they choose that. There's going to be plenty. Uh, they're going to be able to drink. And by the way, they can come out and drink at any time. It's their choice to be in the building illegally. All this is obvious, I think. Um, even It's so obvious. Even Al Sharpton and freaking Mika Brzezinski seem to understand what's going on. Watch. We need to pressure Netanyahu to move towards a ceasefire and bring those hostages okay, home. Joe is the this worst of all three of these people. Bigger cause. And let me say this. The politics of that, what is being robbed by them not doing that, Joe, where you and I agree, how do the Democrats, how do all of us on that side say January 6th was wrong if you can have the same pictures going on on college campus. Lord, don't make you a parallel with January 6th. You lose For the some moral reason, high That has happened, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it kind of seems like it's tough to criticize the January 6th people if you're allowing this. And Mika blurts out, well, you're not allowed to compare to January 6th. You might think she's being liberal there. No. Seems like she's actually being conservative because she got called out for making that same comparison. The comparison's obvious. You have no intellectual consistency if you can't see it. If you can't say, well, hey, I have a problem with January 6th, which, by the way, I did. Made it very clear to you at the time. Did not, I don't like rioting. I don't like people taking over buildings. Um, it's easy for me to be critical of these protests and the, you know, the George Floyd protests because I'm consistent. She's trying to be consistent, saying, well, January 6th was really bad. How can we can be uh, critical of that if we don't, aren't critical of this? And she apparently got slapped down by either someone in her company or just generally leftists online because we're living in an insane time. So let me leave you with a less insane time. How do you deal with something like this? Here's Ronald Reagan talking about the Berkeley riots back in 1969. Those people told you for days in advance that if the university sought to go ahead with that construction, they were going to physically destroy the university. The now, why did Congress you negotiate many times? Negotiate? What is to negotiate? What is? What are we university just... is a public institution. That's it's right. An important institution but the university, for all of the... The, its own community, and for the community of Berkeley that live around it. All of it began the first time some of you who know better and are old enough to know better let young people think that they had the right to choose the laws they would obey as long as they were doing it in the name of social protest. Amen. Amen. Uh, since 2007, Folds of Honor has provided life-changing scholarships to the spouses and children of Americans, America's fallen or disabled in combat. In 2023, this was extended to include the families of uh, fallen first responders as well. They've awarded 51,000 scholarships and more than $200 million so far. And the need is still great. But together, we can make sure that no qualified applicant is turned away. Why am I telling you about this? Well, Flying Ace has aligned with Folds of Honor to ensure the children of our American heroes receive the education they deserve. As proud supporters of Folds of Honor, Flying Ace has had the privilege of providing hope for the families of those who protect our freedom. To that end, Flying Ace is proudly sponsoring four scholarship awards um, quarterly uh, this year. Uh, and if you can, donate today and help them make a great impact. Go to flyingacespirits.com. You might find some other products there you might like as well. As well as helping out, you might find some other products you enjoy at flyingacespirits.com or scan the QR code, which we've got. Oh, look, we've got a QR code right on the screen right now. The link is also in the show notes. Uh, when you purchase a bottle of Flying Ace, you will be donating to Folds of Honor. Make sure you use promo code AMERICA and get free shipping on every order. Flyingacespirits.com. Flyingacespirits.com. Promo code AMERICA. I want to bring in Justin Haskins. Uh, he is the Socialism Research Center Director for the Heartland Institute, co-author of both The Great Reset, Joe Biden, and the, first, and the Rise of the 21st Century Fascism, and Dark Future, Uncovering the Great Reset's Terrifying Next Phase. You may know them, uh, you may know his co-author as well, Glenn Beck. Uh, you may have heard of the guy. Um, they're both available wherever you get your books, both great reads. Je Justin, thanks so much for coming on the program. 
It's great to be back with you. Appreciate it. Um, you've got some interesting polling coming out of the Heartland Institute. I, I say interesting, but it's incredibly disturbing. Um, and it's talking about election security. Can you can you walk us through your approach here? Yeah, sure. So uh, back in December, actually, we ran a poll with Rasmussen Reports uh, that asked about voter fraud in the 2020 election. And what we asked people was a series of questions. First, we asked them if they voted by mail, and then we asked them a series of questions about illegal activities related to voting by mail, like filling out other people's ballots and uh, being offered money to vote and things like that. Uh, and what we found in that poll was a, an insanely high number of people said, yeah, I engaged in some kind of illegal voting activity. It was about one in four mail-in ballot voters, which is really disturbing, <laughs> obviously. Um, and so fast forward to more recently in April, we decided let's ask similar questions. Let's actually tighten the language of the questions up. Let's ask even more questions. Let's get a bigger sample size. And this time, instead of asking about 2020, let's ask about 2024. Let's let's see what people would be willing to do in order to help their candidate win and the opposing candidate lose. And what we found was absolutely incredible. Uh, we asked people questions like, um, if a friend or a family member or spouse or someone like that came to you and said, you can just have my, my vote, you can vote for me, and you can even sign it and forge your signature, would you do it? We asked people, uh, would, you off, would you steal a friend or family member's ballot or alter a family friend uh, or, or the ballot of a friend or family member? Uh, would you throw it in the trash or destroy it in order to help your candidate win? Would you, would you offer to pay somebody to change uh, their vote? Would you offer to, uh, would you um, engage in a whole bunch of other different kinds of questions, right? And for the most part, what we found was between 10% and 18% of people said yes. Roughly on average, it fell in that, that range. And when you add it all up, it was 28% of the people we polled said yes to at least one kind of illegal voting. So if that's true, that would be 28 percent of, say, 155 million or so ballots that were cast in the last election. So you're talking tens of millions of people saying, yeah, we if, if given the opportunity, I would absolutely cheat to help my side win. Um, and what's even more remarkable is when you start looking at the demographics to these questions, there are some really, really interesting things. The most important one was that about half of young people said yes to at least one question. So. The older you got, the less likely you were to say you were going to cheat across the board. But young young people were the most likely to say that they'd be willing to cheat to win. And it was half. So given the fact that we have widespread mail-in balloting still in the vast majority of states and that there are really not many rules to stop certain kinds of cheating for mail-in balloting, and now given the fact that we know that a very large percentage of people are willing to cheat – you know, it seems like a recipe for disaster. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I, it looks like we're it's like slow motion heading toward a catastrophe again in 2024, as if we've never learned our lesson from 2020. And I don't know why people are are really ignoring it, policymakers, because this is a crisis in the making. It really is. Uh, and, and I mean, the numbers are obviously big enough to, to overturn an election. I mean, that's that's it's way more than the margins obviously would be. Um, it, it was, it's interesting because, you're, as you mentioned in your previous poll, there was some part of that, like, that maybe people just didn't know the law, right? Like, maybe they didn't know they couldn't do X, Y, and Z. Um, these, the questions for this poll seem to be more explicit and, and kind of saying, hey, in the future, will you break the law? Uh, normally, you should just, in case you're wondering, by the way, if anyone ever asks you that, just say no. I mean, it's amazing that this many people admitted to it. A quarter of voters, and as you mentioned, what, nearly half or around half of young voters, this is a, a, massive, a massive problem, and I, you know, it's hard to see how you solve it. Well, I, I, I agree. I think the, the, the basic, the, the most, the, the simplest solution for solving it would be make people vote in person and make them show IDs. Yeah, <laughs> that well, would make yeah. it pretty hard <laughs> to stop it. That, unfortunately, we live in a world where those common sense things are like unfathomable to most politicians these days. So we can't really do that anymore. Um, the other thing that you could do if you're going to have a widespread mail-in balloting is you could require people to have signatures notarized. 
most. You could you could make them go to a notary. The government could provide notaries for free. Most government buildings have notaries. Banks typically offer them for free. If you're going to vote by mail, you've got to have a notary who's an objective third party say, yes, this person who filled out this ballot signed it. This is really them. This isn't someone else. This is a common practice when you're buying a home, for example. There's a whole bunch of other things, legal things that you do uh, that you need to get signatures notarized. Three states actually have this requirement already. Unfortunately, they're all deep red states where it won't have any impact at all on the, on the election in 2024. But if all states had that provision in place, it would probably be really difficult for people to to cheat. Uh, so there are solutions. It's just policymakers generally don't seem interested in pursuing any of them. They're just rolling the dice over and over and over again and hoping they get a good result. Yeah, I guess I mean pragmatic uh, solutions, the solutions that can happen, because obviously no blue state is going to approve this. <laughs> Why? Because they know there's a good chance if it's going to benefit anybody, it's going to benefit them. And, and this shows in your polling. And now it's pretty close. It's interesting how close it is. A lot of Republicans will say they will also cheat to help their side. It wasn't all Democrats. It was a it were more Democrats than Republicans, but not uh, exclusively Democrats, in case that's what you're thinking this would show up. So, I mean, at the guess at the end of the day, do we believe this is going to make a difference? Do we think that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, like there's going to be a a big margin or just all this stuff just kind of cancel each other out? Well, uh, so a couple of important things there. You're absolutely right. That's a really important factor. Republicans and Democrats, Biden people and, and Trump people were about equally likely to say that they were going to commit fraud. Even independents, they were slightly less likely than the other two groups, but not by a whole lot. It's about a quarter say that they're willing to commit some kind of illegal voting. Um, unfortunately for Republicans, this even at equal levels, it actually benefits Democrats substantially more if it happens. And the reason for that is because Democrats are substantially more likely to vote by mail. And mm. mail-in ballot fraud is the easiest kind of fraud to commit. Most of the questions we asked were about mail-in ballot fraud, various kinds of it. And so uh, that was what made the 2020 poll that we did uh, so important, uh, the one from December. Um, it showed about equal levels of fraud for Trump and Biden. I think Trump voters, voters actually admitted to a higher level of fraud. But because there were so many more mail-in ballots cast for Joe Biden, it actually would have far outweighed any benefit that Trump would have received from it. So it isn't going to balance itself out, even if it's 50 50. Um, and, and so I mean, this is a this is this is I can't over overstate how important of a problem this is, especially in light of the fact that it is easy to commit many forms of fraud. Still, it's still very easy to commit fraud within a household where you're voting for someone else who's in your house who just doesn't care and they give your vote away, right? Like that's still really easy to do. Um, it's still really easy to vote for friends and family members to steal people's mail-in ballots or to change it on the way to the, the ballot box or whatever. Like a lot of that is very easy to do, which is why most states never had mail-in balloting unless it was absolutely necessary. Um, so this is this is a crisis and it's and it's going to get so much worse because half of young people say this is OK. So what's going to happen in 20 years from now it, when half of young people, half of voters are the group that we're looking at right now? You know, I mean, we have to solve this problem permanently. We got to go back to reasonable, common sense voting integrity laws. And until we do that, I don't think as. Horrible as it is to say, I don't think you can actually trust the outcome of close elections, given how easy it is to commit fraud and how open people are about saying, yeah, if given the chance, I'll do it. Mm, it's uh, really amazing. And it's eye opening as to what we're looking at. I, I, I agree. I mean, we'd be great. That seems like a basic solution. Everyone's had to have something notarized in some uh, in some context. You could hire a bunch of new people. Give you could say you're creating new jobs with notaries all over the country to help out during this process. But like, I mean, the old school way of absentee balloting with an excuse, and even that would go a long way. We are now way down the other road, and I can't imagine it going the opposite direction. At least in blue states at this point. Uh, Justin Haskins, if you haven't checked out the Great Reset uh, or a Dark Future, make sure you do that as well and uh, check out this poll. It's for the Heartland Institute. Where can people find the details on this, Justin? If they go to heartland.org, they can find the polls right on the front of the main page there, so it's not hard to find. Okay, heartland.org. Justin, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks, Stu.
I've been telling you about Gen 90 for a while now. This is the latest breakthrough in skin care from our friends at GenuCell. It's the best in skin care over at GenuCell, and they do a great job providing great new products all the time. Gen 90 is one of them. Um, did you know it works on, you know, let's say, bags and puffiness under your eyes? Uh, instantly, by the way. You can instantly reduce the appearance of looking older anywhere you use it, around the eyes, forehead, crow's feet, laugh lines, even the chin. You don't have to worry about your skin or your confidence ever again with Gen 90. Gen 90 technology is luxurious, paraben-free, silky smooth, and best of all, it starts working in seconds. And now you get Jenny Cell's classic under eye bags and puffiness serum with every Gen 90 order and the luxurious GenuCell XV collagen builder moisturizer with vitamin C, hyaluronic acid, pure natural base. They got all the stuff. And look, I, let me just, this is all the stuff they want me to make sure you understand so you know it's a great product. But I will say this, Mother's Day, it's like a week away. Now might be the time to get a hook, a hook up uh, you know, your mom with some GenuCell. And I will say, GenuCell's got a great deal going on. They have over 50% off on GenuCell's spring sale. Uh, results are guaranteed or your money back. GenuCell.com slash stew is where you go to get it. If you order now, though, they give you a free limited edition spa box with bonus gifts and free shipping. I'm not saying you should do this. This is, uh, this is not their recommendation. But what I'm saying is if you order that and you get it all in, you can divide up all the presents for all the moms. So you only have to buy one thing and then you can hook up a bunch of people with it. They don't know the spa box is free. That is not what Jenny Cell told me to tell you, but I'm just saying technically you could do that if you wanted to. GenuCell.com slash stew. GenuCell.com slash stew. Get it now. G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash stew. Well, they're trying to take more of Donald Trump's money through fines. They're asking for $4,000 more for violating gag orders four times last week. Now, let me give you a couple of the examples of what they're saying are violations of this gag order. He said the jury was picked so fast, 95 percent Democrats, that area is mostly all Democrat. I mean, I don't know if it's 95 percent, but it certainly is mostly all Democrat. And it was picked fast. I mean, there was all sorts of news coverage about that. I don't think there's anything po that you could possibly say that isn't true there. I mean, factually, maybe it's not exactly 95 percent, but the overwhelming majority is fair. Um, and they said, well, if you're speaking about the jury at all, they place the proceeding in jeopardy. What are you talking about? I mean, I, saying that it, he, the, the jury was picked from a Democratic area is not putting the jury in jeopardy. Um, also, uh, they say that he called Michael Cohen a liar, which, look, I mean, Michael Cohen's admitted to many lies. I don't know how that's even controversial. And National Enquirer publisher David Pecker, a nice guy. So the fact that he called David Pecker a nice guy is, is a gag order violation. Um, they, he said uh, they want $9,000 from the last time they find him. And they are threatening him to put him in prison I, or jail, at least, uh, because of this. I think Trump basically wants this. I think he'd actually be happy with a jail uh, sentence. I think it would benefit him. I think people would see him very sympathetically if he went to jail. Plus, it would, Glenn kind of pointed this out on the radio show, and I think it's a good point. It would sort of prepare uh, the American people, if he went to jail, they saw him in jail, they kind of thought it was a BS reason. If they throw him back in jail, the same proceeding afterward, people are going to be like, all right, roll their eyes a little bit. This is the same thing. So I think that's possible. Uh, another uh, big deal is uh, the Marjorie Taylor Greene thing. She's going to go ahead next week, try to oust Speaker Mike Johnson. And look, I said this before, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we went over this with the McCarthy situation. I think this is pretty darn similar, frankly. Uh, the issue is, number one, huge risk in trying to change speakers because all you need is a couple moderates who get pissed off at you that could go to the, the left side and Hakeem Jeffries could be Speaker of the House. Uh, the, the, the Ralph Barrick uh, testimony we talked about a little bit earlier this week came out of the House um, uh, you know, proceedings. You need to have control. Even though you're not going to pass any laws right now because of the way this is set up, having control is vital. Having uh, some sort of speed bump to stop what Biden wants to do is vital. So... You can't lose that and you don't want to risk it because it could go the other way. Secondarily, I will say we've now put Mike Johnson as the same thing with Kevin McCarthy in a position where he owes his political life to Democrats. Hakeem Jeffries bailed him out. He would have lost his gig. And now he owes his political life to a bunch of Democrats who can say, we will not support you if you don't do X, Y and Z. And like you might say, well, he should stand up to that. Well, he probably should. But that doesn't mean he will. And if you're giving a lot of pressure, putting a lot of pressure on him to make sure that he uh, now has to please Democrats, I just don't see how this ends well. And look, you know, I, I, Thomas Massey's on board with us. I love Thomas Massey. I, I don't agree with him on this particular take. I just don't think there's a good ending to this. At this point, you just got to get to the end of the election and get more seats. That's the solution here. 
win more seats. If you have more seats, you have more of an opportunity to be able to uh, to have wiggle room on this stuff. But you you don't right now. There's it's almost an impossible situation for any speaker to do what you want him to do right now. So you need to kind of step back and honestly just stop the worst from happening. It's give up the oppor- the thought that something good is going to happen and just try to stop some of the bad. I'm making sure you have fruits and vegetables in your diet. Kind of important. You know, mommy probably told you that back in the day. Mother's Day, around the corner. Maybe, I don't know, start eating your fruits and vegetables. Now, I know you're not going to do that fully because you probably are like the rest of America. You don't eat half of the recommended servings of fruits and vegetables in a day. It's a big gap in your nutrition, and you probably don't think about it that much. Plus, inflation has made this so freaking expensive. But Balance of Nature provides an on-the-go solution, and they haven't raised their prices in 10 years. The proprietary blend of... 31 fruits and vegetables come in easy to swallow capsules and that will give your body so much of the nourishment it needs. You can try 31 different kinds of produce in a single day. That's going to be difficult to do for most people. Balance of Nature fruits and veggies gets that done for you like immediately. Go to balanceofnature.com. You'll get 35% off plus $10 off any additional sets with your first order as a preferred customer using the discount code STEW. That's limited to five sets, but you'll save a ton of money while you're getting the fruits and vegetables you need in your diet. Balanceofnature.com. Balanceofnature.com. Use the promo code STU for 35% off. It's balanceofnature.com. Code STU. You know, some of these elitists on the left are kind of in the middle of everything. Like these stories pop up and you're like, gosh, I wonder what's going on. And then you find out the same person is kind of behind every single one of these. Probably most famously, the name you might know around these parts is George Soros. He's kind of in the middle of everything, but he's not the only one, right? Another one who's in the middle of everything seems to be Uma Abedin. And, you know, here's someone who, uh, if you remember, she was married to Anthony Weiner. She was like the number one assistant for Hillary Clinton. Just kind of always seemed to be involved in the biggest, uh, most egregious violations of the Constitution, in my view, uh, uh, from the left. You got the left. These organizations are always doing something, and you know, Uma Abedin is always sort of around. Anyway, um, new news. Uma Abedin and Alex Soros are dating. I kid you. <laughs> I kid you not. Yes, they are dating. They were apparently they shared a trip to Paris, which is uh, very nice. They were at the Knicks Sixers game, the first round of the playoffs. Uh, together, and they will make their public debut together at the Met Gala, which is the most fitting thing of all time. So Alex Soros and Uma Abedin together. That's so incredibly wonderful. I wish them the best, uh, at least in their relationship. I wish them the worst for their political efforts, but I wish them the best in their relationship. Hopefully this one turns out a lot better than the last one for Uma, because the last one got a little weird. Hopefully he's not like messaging 14-year-olds on the internet. I, we can only hope that she has that much uh, of a grandiose and wonderful dating future. So we're still at the end of the spring here, going into the summer. Uh, things are going to really start picking up for the election here in the next couple of months. We've got the uh, conventions coming up. We've got a VP pick around the corner. One of the things I'm going to do on State of the Race tomorrow is look at the VP possibilities, who's leading the pack, uh, who's maybe not anymore. Um, we will get into that on State of the Race. Now, this just is audio only. It's available uh, tomorrow on the Stu Does America feed. So just go to uh, wherever you get your podcasts, subscribe to the Stu Does America feed, and you will get this audio-only bonus pod tomorrow. State of the race, looking at the 2024 race from a perspective you probably won't get anywhere else. Check it out wherever you get your podcasts.